guys can be seated. Um, I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you realize it, we have been in the tangible, tangible presence of the Lord. There's a scripture in the Old Testament where this king was trying to uh, wreak havoc. And word got to him because he said everybody was, you know, talking behind his back because the, the children of Israel would appear to outsmart him. And they said, there is a man who serves a God who knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart. About four weeks ago, the Lord began dealing with me and I shared with the intercessors that we needed to hone in on people walking in deliverance and liberation, and um, which stirred my heart toward where we're going today. But one of the things that I recognize and I understand is, you know, the reason many people don't get free is because they don't even own up to what's going on in their life. Are you with me? And y'all can say, you can say amen. Whoever said, come on, God bless you, I am going to go on. <laughs> I feel like those words of uh, Martin Luther King, free at last, free at last, good God, God Almighty, I'm free at last. <laughs> I'm getting to preach today. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Ooh, ooh for y'all. Anyway. So as I was pondering that, this question has risen in my heart for probably a year off and on. And it, the question is, what keeps you awake at night? What, what is it that keeps you awake at night? What is it that gets you so messed up that you can't go to sleep? You know, I've heard milk does the body good. I don't drink it. I drink the ice cream kind. <laughs> and I don't like it when it melts down too much. It makes me think of, hmm, milk, hmm. But I'll tell you what does the body good. Resting at peace in the Lord. When you close your eyes and when you go to sleep and you're at peace in the Lord. But the problem is a lot of us, a lot of people struggle. So I want you to think for just a moment of the time when, maybe recently, when something kept you awake and your mind just kept running. And I want you to think how it made you feel. Several months ago, um, we had a situation here at the church and uh, we had some flooding. Y'all know about that and thus we have shiny floors today, and uh, just all the transition that's going on. Pastor Zach and his team have done an unbelievably incredible job, and we thank the Lord for that, and we encourage you to realize that uh, we don't do a building fund offering a lot, but this is a good way for you to sow into what's happening. It's a great investment, but we were having some struggles with the insurance company, and it went on for about 10 months, and for about two months of that time, I didn't sleep a lot, and I was worried, and I was anxious, and I was frustrated, and, you know, all of us feel like we have the ability to take care of things, right? All right, guys, don't make yourselves out to be storytellers. God created men to fix problems, amen? So if there's a problem, what are you going to do? That was not a loaded question. So, guys, if there's a problem, what are we going to do? even if our wife wants us just to listen. Amen. We're still going to try to fix it because God created us to fix the prob problem, right? But I realized in the process of that two months and not sleeping much, I realized that this was beyond me. It was completely beyond me. I'd made calls. Uh, Lewis and Chad enjoyed the stories I would tell them of calls that I made and what I told them. I didn't curse. I didn't scream, but I was very blunt in saying, fix the problem. Then they wouldn't call me. As I think they had me on block call. <laughs> Imagine that. So I called them from the church office number. 
They answered that one. Then I think they blocked that one. And then I did what I should have done two months before. I turned it over to the Lord. And it was at that point that God absolutely moved the hearts of people and turned things around. So, you know, as Christians, we're always spiritual. And so, Elaine, I forgot you were back there. Elaine heard some of my conversations. Do not ask her. She's sworn to secrecy. She won't say. <laughs> but, you know, when a problem arises, we want to get super spiritual. You know, we, 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 we don't want to decree that we're worried about a situation. And we over-spiritualize it by saying, well, I'm just burdened. Or I'm concerned about something. When in reality, we're worried and we're anxious and we're afraid. Now, I don't want you to verbalize this. Please, I believe in that, you know, we say things we shouldn't say out loud and let the enemy know things he does. Do you know that the enemy is not all omnipresent? Do you know that? That he's not everywhere all at the same time. He is not. But guess who is? God. So if we don't tell the enemy what's going on in our mind, he can't know because he's not only not all present, He's not all-knowing. And guess what else? If we don't say anything, he's not all-powerful. So he can't press in harder unless we identify, I'm struggling with this situation. Now, I said all that to say this. You've got to ask yourself this question. Don't say it out loud. But what keeps you awake at night? Don't say it out loud. You see, what I've realized, and you may want to write this down. It's pretty good. Um, put it on your refrigerator and probably your bathroom, maybe under your pillow. I don't know how that works. You won't see it, but it'll be there. What we worry about the most reveals what we tr where we trust God the least. What we worry about the most reveals where we trust God the least. And reality is, you know, the enemy, the Bible said, does come against us, but the Word goes on to say, but like a flood... The Lord our God will lift up a standard against him. So don't worry about the fact because you are going to be tried. You are going to be tested. There are going to be problems in your life, but God's greater. And if we could come to that realization that even though the gates of hell rise up, they will not prevail against God's children. There's so much to shout about and rejoice about in your quiet, but it's okay. I just want to tell you today, we've got to stop worrying. We've got to give it to God, and we've got to stop worrying. Probably one of the greatest dissertations that's ever taken place throughout history. I'm talking about all the way back, creation to now. A lot of people have a lot of great things to say. But on this, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said these words five times. I would think that if you say it once, it's important, especially if it's him. He wastes no words. If he says it a second time, it's very important. Now, I'm going to let you figure out if he says it the third time, does that mean very, very, very important? And then if it's four, it's very, 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 very important. And if it's the fifth, what is it Buzz Lightyear said? To infinity and beyond important? That's how important it is. And he said, take no thought. <laughs> Don't be worried about your life. What he's saying is, I've got this under control. If you'll trust in me, if you'll not get worried and get anxious and get frustrated, if you'll trust in me, I've got it. Why don't you look at your neighbor and tell him God's got it? Now, when you look at that statement, that's a, that's a broad statement, don't worry. Take no thought about these things. He says there's nothing in your life, not even food. Now, young people, don't get ticked nor clothes, nor your health or your finances. Nothing, nothing is worth worrying about. As a, as a matter of fact, in this broad statement, Jesus doesn't qualify it by saying, don't worry unless it's your kids or unless it's your job or unless it's your finances or your health or any other thing. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, which one of you can add one cubit to his stature, 
making himself taller. You know, if I would have just been 6'5", Jordan would have been scared of me. I prayed. I enjoyed basketball. Not as much as some that played in a tournament yesterday that I wasn't invited to, but I enjoyed basketball. <laughs> I'm just saying, not calling anybody up, but I do have their initials if you ask. I never got any bigger than six foot. And Jack, I hate to tell you, but once you get older, I've gone to 5'11". It's the wrong way. I mean, maybe I need to pray again. Maybe God will bring me back to where I was at least. He said nobody can add to your stature. Pretty interesting. So why do we worry if we can't control it? Why don't we just give it to God? It's because we fear and we don't trust God. We won't give it to him because we're afraid and we don't trust God. Corey Ten Boone, a woman who spent a lot, a lot of years, a lot of life in a concentration camp, knew what it was like to worry at night, to be anxious, to lay awake at night. She also knew how to walk in victory because she said these words, and I'll quote it. Worry is a cycle of inefficient, now I'm going to classify that, inefficient, useless, wasteful, non-productive thoughts whirling around the center of fear. Did you know that fear fuels worry? Fear literally fuels worry. And you know you can't control what you're afraid of. That's the reason Jesus said, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. That's the reason Jesus said these words, take my yoke upon you. Cast your cares, take my yoke upon you, and learn that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's calling us out to give him this stuff, to lay it at his feet. Well, are you ready? And then leave it there. You know how many paramedics we have in the house today? Everybody. I'm not being a prophet, although I might be a little bit. Hear me. You know why I know? You know what paramedics do when they come to your place? Oh, yeah. They put the zappy zappy on you if they need to. They put the oxygen on you. They do all that stuff. And you know what happens when we die to that and give it to God and we lay it at the altar? When things get rough, we become paramedics. And we say, you know, it was bad before, but I try this and it's worse. And then we immediately start CPR to raise back up that thing that has tormented us for so long because it's more easy to sit there and do nothing and torment some than to fight the good fight of faith, we think. You can say, oh, me, it's okay. Let's go on real quick. David says something in Psalm 62, 7 and 8 that makes a lot of sense. You see, we need to realize that God's trustworthy. We need to understand that God is trustworthy. He's faithful and he's just. It says in Psalm 62, 7 and 8, it says, In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Now, that sounds like a pretty worry-free man. Sounds like a guy that's got it together. This is the same guy that had many struggles. But when you hear him writing, it sounds very clear. He's got something together. This is the same David that wrote in Psalms 91. I thought when y'all were going to quote, I've quoted it so many times. Oh, you're not? Okay. He hideth me under the shadow of the Almighty because I've trusted in the Lord. I put my confidence in the Lord. He says, I'm not going to be afraid for the terror by night nor for air that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. He said, I'm not going to be afraid of COVID, cancer, 
heart conditions, or any other symptom. Because God is my refuge and my strength. Scripture goes on and says he's my very present help in the time of trouble. Sounds like to me David must have been a little bit of a worry-free man. You may want to write this down. I didn't come up with this, but I read it, and it sounded really good for right now. God is trustworthy. It's not what he does. It's who he is. God is trustworthy. It's not what he does. It's who he is. And because of that, he is deserving of our confidence. We put our trust and our hope and our confidence in him because he is faithful. Now, trusting God doesn't mean we bury our heads in the sand. It, doesn't, it literally means that we stand in the Lord and realize that God is faithful. He says to us, and pa- Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, put on the whole armor of God. I'm going to stop there for a second. You know, it's, it's interesting to me. Please don't do this at church. We, we, we pride in ourselves in making sure we're dressed to the max, whatever that is. And we don't leave parts of our clothing off, right? Now, why do we not do that? We're afraid of getting arrested. We're afraid of what people would think. So we all put our clothes on. But why do we not put our spiritual armor, our clothes on? Our attire on. Why do we walk out of our house going into the world half dressed? He said, "Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the uh, stand against the walls of the devil." Then he goes on. He says, "He's talking about the spiritual warfare." He says, "For we do not wrestle with flesh and blood." but against principalities, against against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. He's literally saying we're going to have an encounter warfare. We're going to face the attacks of the devil. And then he says it again, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Why don't you look at your neighbor and ask him, are you half-dressed? Are we clothed in God's armor or not? And he says, clothed in the armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And then he says, and having done all to stand. You know what he says in verse 14? First word, stand. He said, if you've done all to stand, don't turn and run when the enemy comes against you. If you've done all to stand, you stand there. Why? Because we're not standing in our own ability. We're standing in the authority of God who gives us the strength and the liberty to decree and declare the living word of God as ambassadors and his children, also high priests. So we do all we can, and all we should do, (coughs) then we trust God to stand with us as we stand in him. When we stand against the devil, we're not standing in our own ability. We're standing in the authority of the armor that is every part of clothing of Christ. Who is the Word? Come on, Christ. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt. You you got it? Who is our sanctifier? Come on, that's right. Who's our peace? Isaiah called him 700 years before he was born, the Prince of Peace. Are you, are you with me? Who's our righteousness? Abraham said, as the man of faith, he said, our righteousness is as a filthy rags. So his, who is our righteousness? It's Jesus, the, one, the, the holy and righteous one that was able to redeem us by his blood that he shed at Calvary. So what we need to realize is when we're talking about this armor, when we're talking about this spiritual battle, we're, battle, we're talking about being clothed in Christ. Well, then Peter goes on and addresses this, in, in, this, this situation. He said, this devil comes at us as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I'm not trying to be condescending. We all know what the word means, but I want to just emphasize it a little more. I, I looked at different versions, and I heard all these, I read all these different little words they said. But I got, went back to New King James and Old King James, and it says devour, because you know what devour means? Total 
consumption. The devil isn't satisfied with ripping you apart. He's only satisfied when he completely destroys you, your family, your marriage, the faith and word of God that you have inside him. He's only satisfied when he completely devours you. We also need to realize that the devil never sleeps. Okay, before y'all get all down and say, man, I thought this was going the other way. He's not all powerful. He's not all present. And he's not all knowing. That's who God is. Can we give God a hand and clap of praise? Amen. So, in this Ephesians chapter 6, if you read 14, 15, 16, and even 17, you find out that this armor consists of salvation, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, God's word, his Holy Spirit in prayer. Now, with equipment like that, how can we fail? Well, you see, there's one other thing we need to realize that our back is not covered. Oh, but I forgot a scripture that says God is our rear. Come on. Come on, church. Who is he? Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, God's got your back. Now, that doesn't mean we turn around and run. But what I want you to understand is when you stand against the devil and you resist him, he will flee because, I feel the Holy Ghost, because he knows who's on the backside that's got that covered too. We need to rejoice and that we need to praise God and thank God that God has got our back and we're clothed in him. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. But the problem is we've got to keep the armor on. In the good times, we praise his name. In the bad times, we do the same. When we go to bed at night, we need to keep the armor on because the enemy doesn't rest, and he will attack your mind. Are you with me? But if you are truly clothed in the armor of God and you're truly born again, you should be able to say this. I'm saved. Well, Okay, you are not helping me, so here we go. If you are unsaved, you're in trouble. But if you have been saved, if you've been forgiven of your sins, somebody's got your back. Are you with me? That's enough to shout about right there, but let's go on. I'm not only saved, but I'm a blood-bought child of God who reigns in truth and righteousness, in the righteousness of the King. Having been reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed at the cross, I choose to walk in truth and peace, trusting him to lead my steps. His Spirit is within me, and I will persevere in prayer and communion with him daily and always. We can rest in the Lord. If you can't say that, then you need to get right. There's something missing. If you can't say, I'm spirit-filled, I'm blood-bought, God reigns in me, I'm a child of God and all that, if you can't decree that, then something is missing, and God wants to change that today. This should be a constant state, a constant declaration that he's clothed me, he's prepared me, and he does have my back. So if you're faced with something and this stuff is going on in your head and you're struggling... Put on, keep on the armor of God. Here's your checklist. Are you ready? Don't write it down. I'll give it to you later if you want it. It's for sure. Are you saved? Do you know that you're a blood-bought child of God? Are you constantly pursuing Him? You're not sitting idle, not saying, well, I got saved 13 years ago. Mm. How many of your parents... Anybody got a baby? We got a bunch. Mm-hmm. But if we grow a church one way or another, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> There's something in the water. No, I don't know. Anyway, you, you know, they don't stay little. I mean, every month it's a new diaper style. Onesies, onesie bees, twosies, twosies and a half, threesies, almost toddler jump. I mean, I, listen, I mean, 
I, I, they spend hours thinking about a new name to name a diaper so we can buy more. They don't stay the same. They grow. And that's what God has called us to do. We come into Christ Jesus being saved as a baby, as an infant, drinking milk. But we're not just supposed to stay on milk according to the Word of God. We're supposed to grow. And as we grow, we need to realize we can decrease some things and we need to realize that God's Spirit will absolutely guide us. So do we believe and do we live in His truth and righteousness? Have you been reconciled to God? You walk in true peace and trust in Him and allowing Him to lead your steps. Be careful to say yes to that because we struggle with that a lot. Is this Holy Spirit residing in you? Do you persevere in prayer and communication with Him daily? If you can say yes... You've done all to stand. But then when the enemy does attack, and he will, the Bible says you cast your cares on him, for he cares for you. You don't try to work it out. You know, every time men, through the Bible, any time men try to take matters in their, their own hands, there are major problems every time. Some of the struggles that are going on with Israel this day, you can trace back to Genesis 18, 19. God didn't call us to take it in our hands. He called us to cast our cares on him. Now, we need to realize, too, that God can handle it. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, praise God, he's through with the introduction. Amen. You know, I was taught in seminary, I meant seminary, that you're supposed to have three points. I got three. Are you ready? Point number one. You see, you know, we talk about walking in victory, and then we, you know, and we, we, we preach a message that people can relate to about the struggles in the mind and all this stuff that keeps us awake, and then we don't tell you how to fix it. Y'all ready to fix it? All right. Do you believe God's a respecter of persons? No. Y'all answer too quick. <laughs> Colossians 3 said he has no respecter of persons. He loves us all the same. Are you ready? So number one, here we go. Write it down. He's been faithful before. If God's been faithful to you in your life, that's past tense, would you raise your hand? Um, David came to Saul because David had witnessed God's faithfulness. Saul won't... David said he would be willing to go fight Goliath of Gath. He said, listen, God delivered me from the lion and the bear. Notice what he said. I didn't win. He said, God delivered me from the attacks of the enemy. And he said, this uncircumcised Philistine doesn't stand a chance. He did it before. Come on. Say it again. He did it before, he'll do it again. I was in a meeting a few months ago, a place, and a um, person had got a pretty bad report, and uh, I called that person and my wife out, and I said to that person, but I also spoke over my wife, that God did it before, and he did it again, and then I looked and I said, and he'll do it again. I just got word from that person that God's done it a third time. <laughs> and it's critically important that we understand that he's no respect of persons. If he did it before, he'll do it again. And if he did it before and did it again, guess what? He can do it again and again and again and again. And we need to praise and thank God that his arm's not short and his ear's not heavy. So the first thing we need to realize is God has been faithful before. So we can stand in that knowing he's been faithful. Guess what? He's faithful now also. Point number two. Oh, y'all are liking this. I'll just make this one longer. I'll show y'all. I'm cutting up. He's faithful now. He's done it before. He'll do it again. It was Jesus that said that the, the word says that God is with us. You know, he was called Emmanuel, the Lord is with us. God is with us. And I think it's interesting to me that 
He said in Matthew 28, I'm with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. What does that mean? He did it before. He'll do it now. Are you with me? You see, God's faithfulness, you may want to write this down, today is not dependent on the absence of problems, but on the presence of God in our life. So I would ask you, how present is he? You see, light dispels darkness. How present is he? If God's all-powerful, I'm going to tell you, sin can't consume you if God's in you. Let me say it again. Sin can't consume you if God's in you. If you elevate him, it's got to go. Those situations have got to go. So he's been faithful before. He's faithful now. And he shall be faithful tomorrow. He's been faithful before. He's faithful now and he shall be faithful tomorrow. Why? We've got to have something to stand on. Why? Because he changes not. Come on. He doesn't change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, past, today, present, and forever futuristic. Well, I have to preach to myself. His promises, 2 Corinthians 1 and 20, are yes and amen. Do you under... Do I understand what that means? He knows every day of our life. Nothing takes him by surprise. The situations you're going through, the things that can get your mind going wacky, wacky, and, and you can't sleep at night. Do you think it took him by? Oh, God, I didn't know that was going to happen. No, he knew. And all he's waiting, you, waiting on you to do is just say, God, I cast my cares on you because you care for me. You know, people wonder, well, why do we have altar calls? Well, let me tell you real quick because we're about to have one. This is why we have altar calls, because the Bible said if any two or three, come on, shall agree, not just, mm. I'm careful who I let pray for me. Now, Lynn, that's over the prayer ministry team was there, and and Diane, I think, are you here? Yeah, I thought that was you. Yeah, we we have several on our, our prayer team that are here today, and we... We, we trust them. Any one of them can pray over me. But they, some people, I don't let them lay their hands on me. I, what you got, I don't need. Now, now, now see, some of y'all got offended, but I felt it. I said, what, did he, what does he mean? Well, let me tell you what I mean. If you've got jealousy, if you've got lust, don't be praying over me. Pray over yourself. And have some other people gang up with you to get rid of that mess. But anyway, why do we do it? Because if two or three agree as touching anything, they shall, be, they shall ask of the Father which is in heaven. And then he goes on and says, For two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst of them. Why do we have people pray with you? Because there's something, there is something about agreement. And I need to go on and finish this thing up. You see, the other thing is, the third point to this third point is, the end of our story is already written. Everything about your life, God already knows. He knows the struggles. He knows the problems, which remind me of a song that I heard sometime, well, quite a few years ago. And it goes like this. No, I'm not singing. Although I think I might already interview today. It would be a good day. But I'm not. I've been told some things. But I can preach, so here we go. He'll do it again. He'll do it again. Just take a look at where you are now and where you've been. Hasn't he always come through for you? He's the same now as he was then. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. What am I saying? He was God yesterday, he's God today, and he's God tomorrow. He's a healer yesterday, he's a healer today, and he's a healer tomorrow. He's a deliverer yesterday, he's a deliverer today, and he's a deliverer tomorrow. Whatever your situation, he did it before, he'll do it now, and he will do it again and again if you'll just trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understandings and all your way. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. And I know that there are people that are chronic worriers. They have the spirit of Eeyore. 
Y'all fill in the blanks. Just go home and watch a Disney. He'll show up. And you might just say, hmm, that kind of, hmm. I do that, don't I? If the sky is falling, it will only fall on me. If God's in control, he can stop the sky from falling. Do, 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 you, do you understand? As a matter of fact, we get to worrying about, well, what if this happens? Clinically proven, there are more people ill and sick because of anxiety and worry than because of diagnoses that they pronounce over people. So why would we spend all that time worrying, stressing over something we can't change, period? Why wouldn't we just give it to God? And what they have found in their talking to these people is most of what they worry about doesn't happen anyway. My Lord, seven months of stress, two ulcers, and three surgeries over something that never happened. Hello? That'd be like running in the wall and saying, well, I like that. Let me do it a few more times and just see how it feels if it feels better the next time. At some point, we've got to realize, as a matter of fact, Jesus said it in John 14, 1, and I'm done. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Give it to God. Give your situation, your home, your job, your school, your children, your marriage. Give it to God. He can take care of it a whole lot better than we can. Praise him if y'all come real quick. So, we've done all that talking to come back to the focus question. What keeps you awake at night? What is it that keeps you awake at night? What is it that you wrestle with throughout the day? And the real question is, are you willing to give it to him? Are you willing to cast your care on him? And, you know, people say, I'll do it at home. I, I, I used to be an evangelist, and I was interesting probably because I was in people's face. I mean, I knew I'll be there for a week unless they ran me off early, and then I'm gone. But when I left there, I knew that I'd told people the truth. And so I'm going to tell you the truth today. Jesus said these words, if you're ashamed of me, in this perverse, immoral world. I'm paraphrasing for those of you that want to quote it. Read it when you get home. You know where it's at. He said, I'll be ashamed of you when I come from heaven to catch the bride away. What he says is, if you're not willing to stand and admit your situation, you don't have to get on a mic and say it, but you come down here and you ask for prayer and you lay this thing on the altar and you leave it there. If you're ashamed to do that and continue walking in bondage and all. He said, he's taking notes of what we do and how we respond. I want everybody to stand your feet. So it's, 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 it's very, very simple today. If there are things that you're struggling with, you're anxious and worried about, Prayer team, if you're going to get ready to come up real quick. Things you're worried about, you're stressed about, we need to give it to God today. If you have problems sleeping at night, anxious, anxiety over things that are coming against you, you need to come forward. If you've got problems in your life and you want to be free, the Lord can do that right now. And we've got prayer partners that need to pray with you. So we're not going to bow our heads, we're not going to close our eyes. But if that's you, if you're one of those people that are struggling, and I confess it, guys, I got victory, but I, I battled it for two months, almost every night. If that's you, I want to challenge you to come right now. If you're kept awake, if there's anxiety and worry, I want to challenge you to come on. Need some prayer partners, come on. Those of you that are struggling with some of this, Come on.